Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. What's up with Fire and Fury? Huh? Huh? KJRadio.com. <laughs> Uh, eight four four five five one eighty two fifty five. 551 8255 What happened to Fire and Fury, dude? Michael Wolf. Oh, this dude was on every talk show. He was blowing up the talk shows. You know how you know your book is a big deal? They had his big on easels. They had the, the cover of Fire and Fury on both sides, so they didn't miss it at any camera angle. He was prominently placed in, I'm talking, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, you name it. I think he even did Fox. And it was multiple people on each network. He would, you know, like on CNN, he would do, you know, the morning people, Poppy, blah, 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 the weekend folks. And he would do uh, Anderson Cooper, Don Lemon, et cetera. Every show. He did the same thing on MSNBC. I'm not exaggerating how many shows this guy did. I've got clips of him on at least eight shows, at least talking about the book and the leftist media soaking it up. Katie Turr was unbelievable. She was so amenable. He, in effect, the paraphrase of the interview was, well, look, I didn't have to verify all of the facts. I would pretty much go hear one person say one thing, the other person say another. I sort of drew my own little inference from what I heard and it, but it's up to you to figure it out. You know, if there's smoke, there's fire. And then Katie goes, I think where there's smoke, there's fire. I think there's fire. And that was it. Yea, verily. It is a work of nonfiction should be believed. And everybody's treating it. Well, you know, when I interviewed the president, when I did this with the president, and let me just tell you, that's when you start getting into some shaky ground. I'll tell you this. I've met Donald Trump twice. He probably doesn't even remember it. It was so brief. He was walking through an event and, uh, you know, it was very, you know, he was, I I can see it like it happened yesterday, comes through. People weren't making a big deal about him because he wasn't even officially declared. If I'm not mistaken, he hadn't even officially declared as a candidate or, but he was thinking about it or maybe he had just declared, but people were not making a big deal about him. He had people on both sides. He was walking right by me, shook his hand. How you doing, Donald? Boom. Hey. And he walked on by. Then I was at an event not long after that because it was, I think even a, a Rick Perry might have been the big deal at the time. And um, Donald Trump comes in the green room. Hey, Donald, how you doing? Boom. Hey. But, you know, you could tell it wasn't like a I know who you are kind of thing. But I've met him twice. If he sees me, he's not going to go like, who is this guy? And I know for a fact that they know who I am because a couple of people interviewed with him and his staffers went, oh, yeah, we love Kevin Jackson. We love his work. So I know they know me. But I would not pretend to be like this dude. He was pretending. Well, you know, I spent uh, three hours with the president over a period of like a year. Um, I probably have spent three hours with many people that I don't know when I was stuck in the Houston airport and couldn't get out because it was flooded. Or I spent, I spent a good 16 hours with them. Now, I didn't talk to many of them. I talked to a couple of them. But I could see them doing an interview going, yeah, I spent a little time with Kevin Jackson one day. In fact, we had five hours together. That would make you think we really got to know each other. Five hours is a lot of time to be talking to some dude in an airport or anywhere. And so he gets snagged. But my my curiosity is, where is he? Is this dude in witness protection? What, what happened? He completely dried up. You don't hear radio interviews, TV interviews. I think I know what happened. I know you guys know my theory on this, but I'll tell the radio audience. I think he was found out to be a liar. I think the left, uh, they are trying so hard to pin something on Trump that everything they're doing has this hint of desperation. It, It reminds me of salespeople who must make a sale because they overextended in their mortgage or whatever. And I I look at these guys and I say to myself, why did you do that? You know, you go into a sale with the smell of desperation. Even a chumpy animal like a rabbit knows to eat you. (laughs) If you go into 
a desperation sales mode, you know, where you're, you're giving away things without even a negotiation. Well, look, Chuck, if I could get it for half price, I mean, what would it be something that would be of interest to you? What kind of stupid question? Yeah, sure. So you go get it for half price and then Chuck comes in and, and you go, okay, Chuck, hey, we got it for half price. He goes, well, congratulations. Now I know you can get it for half price. <laughs> what do you think he's going to ask for now? Think you can get more? I don't know. Well, you know what? I'm not that interested. That's what. That's the desperation sale. If Chuck had gone in there and said, look, I this is amazing product. I got about 10 more minutes before I got to go see my next client. Uh, this product is about to be on allocation. I need to go because I got somebody that's ready to place an order. Can I come back to here tomorrow? Are you available tomorrow? That's a whole different sale. And if and if you have if you're flush, meaning you got the cash to burn and I'll wait you out. I mean, I, you know, it varies by product, but I'm just saying if you there are people that were like that. I remember memory back in the day. It's not like that any, anymore. It's not even close. But if you memory was on what they call allocation. So you went into your big computer manufacturers, which was compact at the time, HP, Dell, and you didn't take, you didn't uh, take a, it, it was, it was no orders or anything. All you did is you went in and said, okay, here's your allocation compact. You're going to get 1 million pieces of this size DRAM. Dell, you're going to get half a million, you know, whatever. HP, we're going to give you 700,000. And all the, the only thing that buyer could do was go, can I get a little more allocation? It was like selling crack, you know, and, uh, and, and, and all the crackheads had money. It was just like that. So you could go, okay, crackhead, look, uh, I've got two ounces of, of crack I can sell to you. I can sell total. I'll take them. No, you can't do that because i got to satisfy my other clients. Well, how much will you let me have? That's where we were in allocation. So let me tell you what's happening and to put it into our perspective. We were se- The left was selling bogus dope. <laughs> And we were buying it up in abundance. And now we're finally to the point where we have cleaned up our act and we no longer need their dope. And they've got it in droves. They're trying to get rid of it. And there are no takers. That's where we find ourselves. That's a good place to be, conservatives. We're off of it. They come over with the little baggies and go, look, look here. Woo. So fire and fury. He's a liar. He's gone. This Russia investigation. It's a lie. It's gone. We're off the dope. We're off the media dope. We're off the narrative, the fake news narrative dopes, dope, whatever you call it. We don't have, we're no longer hooked on it. We aren't even enticed by it. Not at all. They can't handle that discredited fire and fury author pure work of fiction and the leftists find themselves back at square one they don't even know how to behave this is the kevin jackson radio show